In this video, we're going to look at various error checking mechanisms. In particular, parity bits, majority voting, checksums and check digits. With the complexity of computers and the vast amount of ones and zeros being transmitted along cablings and through the air to represent even simple text documents, errors occur. Now, errors arise for a large number of reasons on a network, including electrical storms and interference. And this is usually in the form of electrical noise. But the end result is the same. Binary zeros and ones get corrupted. Let's go through each of these four methods now and explain them. So first of all, let's look at parity bits. Computers submit data in bytes, which we know is eight bits. Now normally, ASCII characters do not make use of the most significant bit, storing the letter in only seven bits. This leaves us one leftover bit, which is unused, which we send with every single byte. We can put this to good use, and we do. We use what's called a parity bit. So here, for example, is the ASCII character code for the letter G. 1000111, with a leading uh, zero here in the most significant bit, which isn't used. If we send in even parity, then just before we send it, we set this most significant bit so that the number of ones in the total message is even. So we have one, two, three, four ones, so that's already even, so we set the parity bit to zero. With odd parity, we do the reverse. We set the parity bit so the total number of ones is odd. So we have one, two, three, four for G, and we add one so the number's odd, and then we send it. Now, if during transmission, one of these bits gets corrupted, say this one gets replaced with zero, at the other end, the computer will know that we're using um, even parity. It will add up the number of ones, one, two, three, realise that we should have an even number, and it will know that this eight bit, one byte uh, letter has arrived corrupted. Now, at this stage, it's unable to tell which bit has been corrupted, so it has to ask for the bytes to be resent. And of course, if two bits came corrupted, then we would end up back at even parity and the receiving computer would be none the wiser. This is why a number of error method checking techniques are used, and we don't simply rely on any given one. So now majority voting. This is a crude method of identifying errors in data by transmitting binary digits multiple times and then we look at the pattern received. If the pattern doesn't match, then we use this majority rule to check which bit occurs most frequently and we just assume it's the correct bit. So here we receive a string of data. Now we're assuming majority voting in blocks of three. So every single bit is being sent three times. Now, a bit should be a one or a zero. So we check the first and we notice that we've got two zeros and a one. Well, that can't be right. So the two zeros override the one and it records the result as a zero. I received three ones, no problem. Three ones, no problem. Three zeros, no problem. Here I received two ones and a zero. It knows there must be a problem. Two ones outvote the zero, so it records a one. And so on and so forth. The received pattern then, although we ended up receiving this, we have automatically managed to correct it to this and receive the letter J. And the advantage here is I don't have to request the data again. However, of course, now I'm sending three times the amount of uh, bits just to receive an 8-bit character. Now onto check digits. This is a kind of a form of redundancy check and it's used for error detection on identification numbers, such as bank account numbers. Now these are used in many applications where they will at least sometimes be input manually. Now when long strings of numbers are input manually, it's obviously prone to human error, and a check digit helps to get around this. So here's another example of a long number that can often be entered manually. Uh, this is the ISBN 10 number system used for books and it uses a process called modular 11 to create and check the check digit. The actual last number you see on an ISBN code, if you look at the back of the book, 
is the check digit. Now you're not required to actually know modulus 11 for the exam, but it's useful to have a little bit of background. So what modulus 11 does is it takes the original code. So here it is, 81752566, and we write it out. Each digit of the code is assigned a weight. And the far right hand side aside the weight of two, and then the weight of three and four, and we carry on. We multiply the original code by the weight. So six times two is 12, and we do that all the way along. We then add together all the products. So now we have the number 275. We now divide that by 11, hence the name modulus 11. And we look at the remainder, the remainder is zero. We subtract the remainder from 11, 0, and divide again. Now this might seem quite complicated, but the number we end up with is the check digit we place on the end. The beauty of this is to check the code number is valid, it's not necessary to recalculate the actual check digit. If the check digit itself is given a weighting of 1, because don't forget this first digit here previously was a weighting of 2, and the products of the digits, including the tech digit, uh, are divisible by 11, then we automatically know the check digit is correct. A similar concept is called the checksum, and this is a mathematical algorithm applied to a block of data. The data from the block is used in order to create an initial checksum, and we then add this checksum and transmit it along with the original data. The same algorithm is applied at the other end. If the checksums match, we consider the data to have been transmitted correctly, otherwise we know it's been altered. Now, there are various checksums out there, and some of them have quite complex algorithms. You don't need to know any particular ones for the exam. But here is a simple example. If we imagine transmitting uh, this block here, and our simple algorithm simply takes every eight bytes and turns it into numerical binary value and adds the total together. When we reach the other end, the same thing's performed on the string, and if we ended up with 456, we can have a relatively safe assumption that none of these bits were changed in transit. Now, none of these methods on their own are foolproof, but there's a bit of an overview into some of the methods we can use to help with error checking and correction.